suffering at the hands of Rome, cause they believe in Christ alone. They died through Europe, especially Spain, for they saw all but Christ in vain. He suffered by his death for men to save them from their awful sin. Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand. The Roman popes rule the land. Those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy. We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie, with 50 million reasons why. Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man, salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Good evening. Welcome to Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next two hours. We're reading and discussing the book Romanism and the Reformation, and we'll pick up where we left off on page 206 in the online version. We'll have one hour of reading and then one hour of open discussion. Please keep your discussions and questions pertinent to the reading of the book. It's this book that is of interest to Protestants, true Protestants. We're finding out what true Protestantism is and what the Protestants of all ages during the Christian era, what all Christians during the Christian era believed who the Antichrist was, the papacy. Now, beginning in the first full paragraph on page 206, the author, Henry Grattan Guinness, says, Before we leave this medieval period, there are three remarkable testimonies to which we must just refer. Gregory the Great, Pope Gregory the Great, or rather Antichrist Gregory the Great of the 6th century, declared before Christendom that whosoever called himself universal bishop or universal priest was the precursor of Antichrist. In this, he was doubtlessly perfectly correct. Imagine that. A pope, Gregory the Great of the 6th century, said with his own mouth, whosoever calls himself universal bishop or universal priest was the precursor of Antichrist. And don't you know the very next pope, after Gregory the Great, adopted for himself those very titles, universal bishop and universal priest. Henry Grattan Guinness continues, In this he was doubtlessly perfectly correct. When Boniface III, Pope Boniface III, shortly after the death of Gregory, took this title in the year 607 A.D., he became the precursor of Antichrist, as fully revealed under Pope Boniface VIII. Gerbert of Reims, before the year 1000, said of the Pope sitting in his lofty throne in gold and purple, that if destitute of charity, he was Antichrist, sitting in the temple of God. Now let me make sure you understand what he said. If it were not for his charity, he was Antichrist, sitting in the temple of God. 
In other words, Gerbert of Reims said of the Pope that he was so wicked that he would deceive no one. Everyone would recognize him as the Antichrist of the Bible, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, except for his charity. Now, let me comment upon this. Anyone who knows the Roman Catholic Church knows that it uses charity to cloak its diabolical nature. Were it not for the almost unlimited charitable work of the Roman Catholic Church, more people would see the wickedness of the Roman Catholic Church, just like the Protestant Reformers did, and all Bible-believing Christians before that time. But because of the charitable work of nuns and priests and monks and the church, the Red Cross and all of the other Roman Catholic charities, the Roman Catholic hospitals, the Roman Catholic nursing homes, the Roman Catholic soup lines and soup kitchens, if it were not for the charities that they perform in the world, more people would recognize the very wickedness of that church. And it's, and again, he says, if destitute of charity, he was Antichrist sitting in the temple of God. Now, I want to remind the listeners that it was not long ago that President Barack Obama, with several of his pre- presidential predecessors, Pope, or, uh, Bill Clinton being one of them, and George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush, others were standing on the White House lawn, and they were all lauding Roman Catholic charities and encouraging people from the White House lawn to send your money to Roman Catholic charities. They're the most widely known, the, the richest charities on the earth. There are Roman Catholic charities, and our own government promotes it. And if it were not for this charity, the charity of the Roman Catholic Church, more and more people would see past that cloak and recognize the ultimate wickedness of the Roman Catholic Church. I suggest that we starve the whore by not giving her any more money. Do not support Roman Catholic charities. It is the Church of Antichrist. All right, continuing, he says, lastly, Beringer in the 11th century, referring to the Pope's enforcement at that time of the doctrine of transubstantiation, that's where the priest says the five magic Latin words over the biscuit, the Jesus cookie, I call it, and then Jesus is yanked off of his throne and then is bodily indwelt in that piece of bread. It's called transubstantiation, where the substance of the bread in the wafer is converted on command of the priest into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ to be sacrificed once again on the Roman Catholic altar in the Mass. It's called transubstantiation. Now listen to what Beringer says about this horrific fraud called transubstantiation. He says, lastly, Beringer in the 11th century referring to the Pope's enforcement at that time of the doctrine of transubstantiation, affirmed the Roman see to be not the apostolic seat, but the seat of Satan. Thus gradually did an understanding of the true character of the papacy dawn upon the Christian church of this period. Finally, the Christian church, the body of Christ, recognized that the papacy was the Antichrist. It's never talked about today, is it? Did you ever hear in any church or any religious meeting that you've ever been to that the Pope is the Antichrist, that all Christians prior to about three or four generations before us, all Christians from that time all the way back to apostolic times affirmed, even at the cost of their lives, having been beheaded, hanged, boiled, flayed, strangled, and burnt at the stake 
they heralded the papacy as the antichrist of scripture and they paid with it for their they paid for it with their lives and many of them knew that calling the pope the antichrist would would cause them to be killed they did it anyway and when they went to the gallows when they went to the stake they were singing god's praises Nothing like that in Christendom today. Nothing like that in Christendom today. Thus gradually did an understanding of the true character of the papacy dawn upon the Christian church of this period. Now, point number three, remember we're talking about three periods of church history, from apostolic time to Gregory VII, from Gregory VII to the or to the to Pius the, or the, uh, Pope uh, uh, Boniface VIII, and from there to the Protestant Reformation. He says, now, we will now, in the third and last place, briefly consider the history of prophetic interpretation from the time of Gregory VII in the 11th century to the Protestant Reformation in the 16th. The pontificate of Pope Gregory VII, or rather, more correctly, Antichrist, Gregory VII, was the era of the papal unveiling. At this date, the Pope dropped the mask of the shepherd and exchanged the crook, the shepherd's crook, for the scepter and the sword. In other words, at this period of time, the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy showed its true colors. The lamb's wool was removed and the lion's fangs were revealed, and the world no longer guessed about what the identity of the Antichrist was. There was a period in Roman Catholic and papal history when there was no pretense of being a lamb-like organization. And you've never heard about it, have you? Not from your pastor, not from your schools, not from your government, not from the mainstream media, not even from most most of the alternative media. He says the accession of Pope Gregory VII in 1073 A.D. is a great landmark in the church history. Gregory VII, or Hildebrand, as he was called, created, as we have stated before, the papal theocracy. That's right, the papacy created a papal theocracy during this period of time, where the pope was king of kings and lord of lords, a universal bishop, universal priest. The Antichrist ruled the governments of the world and persecuted God's people by the use of those governments. The civil powers of all the nations, the governments of all the world, pursued those who called the papacy the Antichrist and had them executed. It says, do you know what this means? He claimed for himself in the name of God absolute and unlimited dominion over all the states of Christendom as successor of St. Peter and vicar of Christ upon the earth. The popes who came after him pushed these claims to their utmost extent. And at the end of the 13th century, they assumed the proud title of masters of the world. That's how the popes described themselves as this papal theocracy grew to its heights. The popes called themselves the masters of the world. Now I want to ask all the listeners, who's the master of the world? the one who created it, right? The real king of kings and lord of lords, Christ Jesus the righteous, the savior of all mankind, all who will come to me. But this wicked man of sin, sitting on his lofty throne in Rome, the city on seven hills, that called Babylon in the scriptures, calls himself blasphemy, the master of the world. And did you know that that's who rules the world today in the new world order? 
You see, what we're describing here is the old world order, that which Christians believe is long dead and gone. But that old world order, which was overthrown by the Protestant Reformation, has now been reassembled after 1929 at the Lateran Accords, Mussolini giving the papacy a vast sum of money, putting the Pope back on his throne in the Vatican, and allowing him national and international sovereignty, and making him also a king of kings. That happened in 1929, along about February 1st of 19, February 11th, excuse me, of 1929, fascist dictator Mussolini restored the papacy. Once he had been toppled by the Protestant Reformation, once he had been toppled by the French Revolution, Mussolini, fascist dictator Mussolini, restored the papacy to his lofty old world throne. And since 1929, the papacy has been rebuilding his papal theocracy in the world. And again, the papacy, after a brief apparent demise, the papacy has been restored. The mortal wound has been healed, and the papacy now again rules the kings of the earth as he did in the old world order. And they cynically call it the new world order, and they expect that we'll never figure out what they're talking about. Well, we don't have to figure it out. Henry Grattan Guinness has figured it out for us. And we can testify from the scriptures that he bears witness against the papacy, from the very scriptures and from the events of history, we know Henry Grattan Guinness is absolutely correct. The new world order is simply the old world order restored. And only after the demise of Protestantism and how was the Protestant Reformation overthrown? By futurism by simply changing the identity of the word he, the second word in the last verse of Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And he shall cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease? It was Jesus Christ who gave up his life on the throne or on on the cross And as that was occurring, the veil of the temple was being rent from top to bottom, just as the high priest of Israel was ready to go into the Holy of Holies and make atonement for all Israel, that Jesus did himself with his own blood. And when that veil of the temple was rent at the time of his crucifixion, all sacrifices and oblations came to a cease to an instantaneous halt, never to be done again. Israel had their lamb. He was hanging on that cross just outside the city. And all who received him had their sins paid for in full. And they were redeemed by the blood of the lamb. No more need for animal sacrifices. No more need for evening oblations. The obla- He caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. But the crafty Jesuits tell us that the he referred to in that passage is the Antichrist. And he won't come until just before Jesus returns, leaving all speculation about Antichrist, the identity of Antichrist, useless. And we can't know who he is. We're not even supposed to know who he is until just seven years or three and a half years before Christ returns. How absolutely ludicrous. It's like God just skipped over the whole Christian, the, the 2,000 years of, of, the, of, the, of the life of, of the body of Christ and focused all of its attention in prophecy to the last seven years of time. It defies common sense. But more than that, it defies the Scripture and it defies history. We know from history who the Antichrist was, is, and always will be, the papacy. And all throughout the Christian history, 
The papacy has been fulfilling every, virtually every prophecy given in the Bible about the Antichrist. Again, he says, the popes who came after him pushed these claims to their utmost extent. At the end of the 13th century, they assumed the proud title of masters of the world. And let me tell you, the papacy considers itself today the master of the world. And if there's any king or prince or queen or potentate of any nation in this world that defies the universal sovereignty of the papacy, the nations of the world are brought to war against that nation. Wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And who fights those wars but Protestant USA? It's unbelievable that this Protestant nation would saddle up with tanks and missiles and armors and guns and and depleted uranium weaponry and go marching off to war all over the European and Asian continents fighting papal proxy wars to help establish this new world order under the papacy. And how could a Protestant nation render itself, pay its taxes for to fight these wars, carry the guns and the ammunition to fight these wars, shed their own blood in the act of committing these wars, all for the benefit of the papacy? It's because we believed in futurism. That Antichrist isn't even a factor in the world today. We don't have to worry about Antichrist. He doesn't come to the last seven years. But let me tell you, Henry Gratton Guinness and all the Protestant reformers and all the Protestants that, be, that preceded the Protestant Reformation, they knew infinitely who the Antichrist was, the papacy, and millions upon millions upon millions upon hundreds of millions of people lost their lives for telling the truth about the papacy. It's only our generation that's ignorant and wondering after the beast with all we have, our fortune, our blood, our money, everything, to fight papal proxy wars all over the world. The American United States of America is nothing but a crusader for the Pope. And why? Because we want a one-world government a one-world religion, a one-world economic system, a one-world social system, all under the control of the government or agencies that the Pope establishes in the world to rule the world as he sees fit, to rule it in his name. That's what's happening in the world today. It's a hideous reality, but we have to come to grips with this. Henry Grattan Guinness is nothing new. Henry Grattan Guinness is only telling us what Christianity has believed for 2,000 years. This book has relevance to us because we've never heard these things before. And you have to ask yourself, who's responsible for hiding for us from us? The history of Christianity, two, for 2,000 years, how have they hid all that history from us? How did they hide from us the beliefs of all the Protestants before our time, all the way back to the Pro- to, all the way back to apostolic times? Who ever heard in our generation that the Pope is the Antichrist? Somebody's responsible for this. We are responsible for this. We're not supposed to be ignorant of these things. We need to turn off the television. Turn off the football games. Turn off the pornography. Turn off everything in our lives and find out (laughs) what this new world order is really all about. And who's responsible? What did God's people believe before our time? Have we been lied to by our preachers? Have we been lied to by our evangelists? Have we been lied to by our government? Who does our government serve? Does it serve the people of, by, and for the people? Or does it serve one person on a golden throne in Rome? Did you ever notice every president of the United States in modern history has made at least one trip to the Vatican and many, as many as seven trips during their administrations? Did you ever ask yourself, 
Why do the presidents of the United States, who are supposed to represent the people of the United States, the majority of which are Protestants, why do they all go to the Vatican? Are they just having tea and crumpets with the pontiff? Or are they taking their marching orders? Every Christian in this country from coast to coast and from border to border ought to hold every president of this country responsible for every word, secret or otherwise, open or clandestine, that's been said at the Vatican, either from the Pope to our president or from the president to the Pope. As a matter of fact, I would make it a law, since there is no establishment of religion in this country, to forbid any president of the United States to ever sit in private with the Pope of Rome, the Antichrist of the Bible. But you'll never see that kind of courage in the American people, because why? They don't believe the Pope's the Antichrist. He preaches Jesus. He cannot be Antichrist. Besides, Antichrist doesn't come until just before Jesus returns. Do you see how thoroughly you've been deceived? What about all the Christians before us? Could they all have been wrong? Could they have been wrong and yet paid for their wrongness with their lives? And why would Rome pursue them if what they claimed was so ridiculous? Why would hundreds of millions of people been roasted at the stake for merely saying the Pope is the Antichrist? How many people have said Barack Obama is the Antichrist? Did any of those die? No, they only die if they say the Pope is the Antichrist. Why is that so important? You begin to scratch your head and wonder, does Tom really know what he's talking about? He sure makes sense. Tom makes more sense in five minutes than my preacher makes in ten years. Do you know what this means, says Henry Grattan Guinness? This pope claimed for himself, in the name of God, absolute and unlimited dominion over all the states of Christendom as the successor of St. Peter and the vicar of Christ upon earth. And you know what? If you go out and ask any Christian on the street, who is the Antichrist, they'll look at you. Well, we're not supposed to know. Do you think God would make it hard for us to figure out who the Antichrist is? He wants all of us to know who Jesus Christ is. The whole Bible is written about what even the words that Jesus would say on the cross. He didn't want us to miss Jesus Christ. Why would he play games with the identity of Antichrist? Is God a trickster of his own people? Why would God deal? If Jesus would give up his life to redeem us, why would he then turn around and make the identity of Antichrist a mystery? That's what the world thinks. That's what the Christian world thinks, that Jesus would leave his throne in glory Come down, be born of a woman, bear our sins, and die on the cross to pay for our sins in the most hideous, torturous crucifixion, and then toy with us and leave us to guess who the Antichrist is. It defies common sense. Who would accuse God of being so trivial and so treacherous with the people that he died for. But that's what all of Christendom believes. Well, they have no problem believing in Jesus, but they don't even care about Antichrist. And that's why they all wonder after him. They all carry his mark. They all obey his laws. They all look to the government of the United States for Social Security, for jobs, for benefits, 
for entitlements, for everything. And the Bible clearly tells us that Daniel would not even eat from the king's table. Why are we any different than Daniel? Is God a respecter of persons? Daniel is different than us? Was Daniel more holy than us? Or should we be like Daniel? We should be like Daniel. If the government serves the papacy and not the people, not God's people, if it rules for the Pope's behest and not for God's behest, if it enforces and upholds the papacy's laws and not God's laws, then it's not a godly government, and we have no moral or legal responsibility to obey the laws of Caesar or of Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. You know, Paul, the Apostle Paul, was beheaded by the Caesar of Rome because he wouldn't obey the Caesar. He wouldn't shut his mouth. He was preaching Jesus and only Jesus. He was preaching the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of Caesar. He condemned Caesar as just a servant of Satan, a man who called himself a God-man, just like the Pope does today. And Paul lost his head. But we wouldn't think of it, would we? No, our government's benevolent. We go fight all these wars across this world to preserve our national identity, our national sovereignty, prevent the spread of communism. Baloney! We're conquering the world for the Pope. The United States government, that that's supposed to act for the benefit of the people, of, by, and for the people, remember? has given all of its power and strength to the United Nations. The United Nations now makes our laws, and they don't listen at all to the people of the United States. They don't even pretend to. And when you see the government of the United States giving its power and strength to the United Nations, you just plainly, common sense has got to tell you, it's not a government of, by, and for the people. So... What does the United Nations represent? It's literally the global government of the Pope. The papacy has observer status in the, par- in the Parliament of the United Nations. Observer status. Why just observer status? Well, because it's its own organization. It observes to make sure that the United States governs the way the papacy instructs it to. And the United States government just kowtows to it. Henry Grattan Guinness is warning us about this antichrist, the papacy. And we've got to listen to it. He said the popes who came after this pope pushed these claims to the utmost extent, and at the end of the 13th century, They assumed the proud title of masters of the world. Three names stand out conspicuously in these three middle centuries of this dark period. Pope Gregory VII, Pope Innocent III, and Pope Boniface VIII. The historian of the Middle Ages well says, quote, As Gregory VII, Gregory VII appears the most usurping of mankind, Till we read the history of Pope Innocent III, so Innocent III is thrown into the shade by the supreme audacity of Pope Boniface VIII. The papacy just gets bigger and bolder and bigger and bolder until Pope Boniface VIII, and what is so special about, about Pope Boniface VIII? Because in his bull entitled Unum Sanctum, he said, It is absolutely necessary for the salvation of man that every man, woman, and child on the earth be subject to the Roman pontiff. Plainly, you cannot be saved unless you are a subject of the Roman pontiff. Where's Christ in all that? Why, we're supposed to believe that the Pope is the vicar of Christ or the replacement of Christ on the earth. 
the Pope is the replacement of Christ on the earth, and we're supposed to believe and obey him as though he were Christ? That's what Pope Boniface VIII said. The epitome of Antichrist was demonstrated in Pope Boniface VIII. You have your Antichrist in full living color, not one detail left out of Scripture regarding the Antichrist. It was all manifest to the world in the pontificate of Pope Boniface VIII. And the whole world wonders after the beast. All the governments of the world govern the people with that objective in mind that every man, woman, and child on the planet must be subject to the papacy for salvation. He says, the historian of the Middle Ages well said, quote, as Gregory VII appears the most usurping of mankind, Till we read the history of Pope Innocent III, so Innocent III is thrown into the shade by the supreme audacity of Boniface VIII. He gives that as a quote from Hallam's History of the Middle Ages, page 384. Look it up yourself. Now, in those days lived the great Italian poet Dante. He described his age with extraordinary power. Written in the 13th century and in Italy, he painted the papacy as the world beheld it then. And what did the world see then? It saw in the papacy the usurping man of sin, and in the Church of Rome, the Babylon of the Apocalypse. That's what the world saw of the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church during the days of Babylon. The Pope was the man of sin, and the Roman Catholic Church was the Babylon of the Apocalypse, of the book of Revelation. Mark, he says, even the world saw it. That's right. Not just the Christian world, but the secular world saw that the papacy fulfilled all the prophecies in the Bible regarding Antichrist. There was no one ignorant about what role the papacy played in the world, what role the Roman Catholic Church played in the world regarding regarding Bible prophecy and history. It was no secret. The secret was out of the bag. Why are we so ignorant today? And who's responsible for that ignorance? You have to keep asking yourselves, Why are we so ignorant of our Protestant history? Who held this history from us? And you have to understand, every authority in this country has helped to hide this history from us, most especially the churches and the schools. Did you ever read anything in your secular history books in the schools about what the world believed of the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy? Did you ever read in in history books in school anything about the Inquisitions and the Holocausts? Oh, yes, we know the Holocaust to be the, the annihilation of six million Jews, but don't you know that there were many, many, many Holocausts before that one, and they weren't Jews. They were Bible believers, God's true people. You know, they covered up the history of that and focused all the attention, all the attention on, on, the, on the murder of six million Jews. Why? Because the Jews are an extreme minority in the world, but Protestants are a majority in the Christian world. And if they're ever restored to their true Protestant history, if they ever find out the role the Roman Catholic Church has played and the papacy has played to annihilate Protestant Christianity in the world, They might be a military threat to the papacy. They might be a military threat to all the governments of the world. They might start another Protestant Reformation and destroy this new world order before it can be restored. Rome says they dare not know their Protestant history. They dare not read Fox's Book of Martyrs. 
They dare not read Henry Grattan Guinness's book, Romanism and the Reformation. We've got to scrub that from all the history books. We've got to call it hate speech and talk evil about the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy. We've got to start killing those who claim the Pope is the Antichrist, just like we did in the Dark Ages in the Old World Order. That's the New World Order, folks. That's right. The papacy is that man of sin. And the Roman Catholic Church is that Babylon of the book of Revelation. And Dante confirms it in his poetry. Hear a few lines from Dante's immortal poem on hell, purgatory, and paradise. Remember, Dante was Roman Catholic. Woe to thee, Simon Magus. Who's he talking about here? Simon Magus, the first pope of Rome. Woe to thee, Simon Magus. Woe to you, his wretched followers, who the things of God, which should be wedded unto goodness, them, rapacious as ye are, do prostitute for gold and for silver. Your avarice o'ercast the world with mourning underfoot, treading the good and raising bad men up. Of shepherds like you, the evangelist was ware, when her who sits upon the waves with kings in fitly whoredom he beheld, she who with seven heads towered at her birth, and from ten horns her proof of glory drew, long as her spouse in virtue took delight, of gold and silver ye have made your God, differing wherein from the idolater. But he that worships one and ye a hundred? Ah, Constantine, to how much ill gave birth, not thy conversion, but that plenteous dower, which is the first wealthy father gained from thee. What dower was Dante talking about? The donation of Constantine. It's an abject forgery, even admitted by the most authoritative historians of the Roman Catholic Church. The papacy began claiming that Constantine donated all the world to the papacy. Constantine ruled the world, and when he gave up his jurisdiction, he gave it to the pope. And by divine right, by the right of Constantine Caesar, the pope now has the same jurisdiction as Caesar had during the Roman Empire. God said, the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. So the pope now says, on the authority of the donation of Constantine, an abject admitted forgery that the earth is his and the fullness thereof. Who is Antichrist? It's the papacy. Even Dante knew it. Even Dante knew it. In his poem on paradise, Dante says, My place he who usurps on earth hath made a common sewer of puddle and of blood. No purpose was of ours that the keys which were vouchsafed me should for ensigns serve unto the banners that do levy war on the baptized. Nor I, for sigil mark, set upon, uh, set upon sold and lying privileges, which makes me off to bicker and turn red. In shepherd's clothing, greedy wolves below range wide o'er all the pastures. Arm of God, how long sleepest thou? Unquote. Dante is calling for the strong arm of God to destroy the papacy who makes mockery of his name. Even Dante knew it. In the end of his poem on paradise, he refers to the Apostle John as the seer that ere he died saw all the grievous times, all the grievous times of the fair bride, the body of Christ, who with the lance and nails was one, unquote. Even Dante 
knew John the Revelator as the seer of God who through his prophecies saw and foretold the entire 2,000-year history of the Bride of Christ. True Bible-believing Christians. But the Pope would have you believe that all those prophecies refer only to the last seven years of time before Christ returns. Who is the Antichrist? It should be obvious by now. You will observe that these beautiful and touching words recognize the historical interpretation of the apocalypse. The Apostle John, according to Dante, saw, quote, all the grievous times, unquote, through which the church was destined to pass. And what Dante saw, the Albigensians saw, and the Waldenses saw. What wonder was there in this? Would not the wonder have been had the saints remained blind to a fulfillment of prophecy so plain and palpable that even the world recognized it? Listen to this again and put yourself in this. He says, and what Dante saw, the Albigensians saw, and the Waldenses saw. What wonder was there in this? Would not the wonder have been had the saints remained blind to a fulfillment of prophecy so plain and palpable that even the world recognized it? Yes, during that time, even the world recognized who Antichrist is. But what does the body of Christ today say? why the papacy is a man of God. That's what Christendom says today. We could not be in any more grievous error than we are. We can all read the scriptures and see how apostate Israel, after God miraculously and visibly delivered them out of slavery and out of bondage of Egypt, fed and watered them in the desert, showed a miracle after miracle after miracle, defended and fought against their enemies for them, kept them warm and lighted by night, kept them shaded and, 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 and led the march by, by day. And they turned against them and worshipped other gods we can easily see the apostasy of the Israelites, but we cannot see our own. And let me tell you, the Israelites only had Moses and the books of Moses. We've got the entire revelation of God, new and old. Where do we stand in comparison to the Jews who rebelled against Christ even after all he did. Jesus came bodily and bore our sins upon his body and bled and paid the price for us all. And what does he find us doing? Wandering after the beast and defending him as a man of God kind of exonerates the Jews now, doesn't it? We're no better than the Jews. We're way worse than the Jews. We can all read our Bibles and wonder how in the world could the Jews have turned upon, turned against God, worshipped idols and images when Christians do it all over the world even after Christ came and bled and died, worshiping Antichrist as the vicar of Christ and joining ecumenically and fighting wars to conquer the rest of the world for the Pope, what must God think? What must Jesus think? The one who bled and died for us, what must he think 
when he looks down from his throne of glory and sees what we do. And what does he think of those who know deep down in their heart that Henry Grattan Guinness is telling the truth and they believe in their heart that the papacy really is the Antichrist of the Bible and yet is too timid to tell anybody about it. Too timid to walk into the church and inform the pastor. Too timid to lose fellowship with friends and family. Too timid to suffer persecution for Christ's sake when the whole world wanders after the beast. What must he think of us? We know what he did to to Jerusalem. We know what he did to the Jews. Scattered them among the nations for 2,000 years. They've had no place to call their home. What must be our punishment? And so richly deserved to. Each and every one of us ought to be on our faces. On our faces in repentance before God, just like Daniel was. In Daniel chapter 9, read the first part from verse 1 all the way down to verse 24. Read how Daniel wept for the sins of Israel and for his own sins and repented and he understood why he was in Babylonian captivity because they had forsaken God's law. But if you ask a Christian today about the law of God, they'll tell you, well, the law is dead. We're under grace. There, there couldn't be a more dire set of circumstances than there is currently in what is called Christendom today. We have put the Jews to shame for sinfulness and rebellion. But we stick to our guns. We're Christians. We're going to heaven. We're going in the rapture. Rapture ready, they call themselves. I got news for you. There isn't any good news except for those who repent and have victory over the mark of the beast and the number of his name. Most people can't even tell you who the beast is. In the sunny south of France, in Provence and Catalonia, lived the Albigenses. They were a civilized and highly educated people. Among these people, there sprang up an extensive revival of true religion. And one of its natural effects was a bold testimony against the abominations of apostate Rome. Here is Sigismund's history of the Albigenses. I can just see Henry Grattan Guinness right now in front of an Uh, an uncountable horde of people in England standing there holding up a book in his hand which only a fraction of the audience could see because his audience stretched clear out of the building and all the way up and down the street. He futilely holds up this book and he said, here is Sigismondi's history of the Albigenses. And on page seven, he says of them and of the Valdois, quote, all agreed in regarding the Church of Rome as having absolutely perverted Christianity and in maintaining that it was she who was designated in the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, by the name of the Whore of Babylon, unquote. That's what Protestants believed in the day of Henry Grattan Guinness and before that the Roman Catholic Church was designated in the book of Revelation by the name of the Whore of Babylon. Rome could not endure this testimony. She drew her deadly sword and waged war against those who bore it. In the year 1208, the Albigensians were murderously persecuted. Pope Innocent III, Pope Innocent III, Good grief, what a mockery. 
he called himself Pope Innocent III. The Antichrist of the Bible called himself Pope Innocent III, employed the Crusaders in this dreadful work of annihilating the Albigensians. The war of extermination was denominated sacred. That's right. The Antichrist of the Bible calls a crusade for the annihilation of the Albigensians, the God-fearing, Bible-believing Albigensians, and he called the crusade sacred. Just like George W. Bush called the crusade against Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan a crusade, a sacred work for God. Are you beginning to get the picture? There's nothing different between the New World Order and the Old World Order. Not one stitch of difference. He says the Pope's soldiers prosecuted this war with pious ardor. Men, women, and children were all precipitated into the flames. Whole cities were burned. In Brazil's every it kind of sounds like shock and awe, doesn't it? Remember that night when we all stay, stayed up late on television? In the middle of the night, when the United States opened the shock and awe, murderous campaign, rather, crusade against Saddam Hussein and, and, and uh, the ancient Babylon of the Bible? Yeah, they're going to tell us that they all conquered Babylon. Now we need to build a Christian world under the Pope, of course, because he's Christ's vicar. You see where that went? You didn't know there was rhyme and reason between this made-up war between the United States and Babylon, did you? Well, we can, all of us Christians can say, well, Babylon's been destroyed, right? Saddam Hussein's not a factor in the world. There was no nuclear weapons. There was no weapons of mass destruction. There was no poison gas. There was nothing. But we conquered Babylon. Now we can have a Christian world, right? Read the prophecies of the Bible. Isn't that what it says? No, that's not at all what it says. The Bible says there'll be, there will be no peace until the Prince of Peace returns. Until then, there will be wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And who's fighting the wars? The papacy. And he's doing it the same way he did in the old world order. He's using the militaries and the governments of the nations of the world to fight her wars for her. And we watch him on television and are oblivious to what's really going on. Again, he says, the Pope's soldiers prosecuted it with pious ardor. Men, women, and children were all precipitated into the flames. Whole cities were burned. In Bazir's, every soul was massacred. 7,000 dead bodies were counted in a single church alone where the people had taken refuge. The whole country was laid waste. An entire people was slaughtered, and the eloquent witness of these early reformers was reduced to the silence of the sepulcher. Are you getting a mental picture of what a holy Roman crusade is? A holy work for God, a sacred work, these crusades? Who did they kill? God's people! And you better know they are the target of the new world order, too. He says, thus began the tremendous war against the saints foretold in Daniel and the Apocalypse. And thenceforth, from then on, it was murderously prosecuted from century to century. Early in the 13th century was founded the Inquisition and full persecuting powers entrusted by the popes to the Dominican uh, to the Dominican monks. He left a whole order of monks to be in charge of the Inquisition. 605 years without cease, the papacy burned Bible-believing Christians who would never bend the knee to the pope. He says a remnant of the Vaudois and by the way, the Vaudois, in our language, not in French, but in English, were called the Valley People, okay? 
They were French Protestants before Protestantism was even cool. Okay? You see, Protestantism has existed all the way back to apostolic times. The Protestant Reformation were just a bunch of Roman Catholics that finally came to the clue. Okay? That's right. All the Protestant Reformers were Catholics before they got the truth. But Protestantism has existed, that is, protest against the papacy has existed all the way back to apostolic times, as we've seen from Henry Grattan Guinness, who even shows us the prayer that the early first century Christians prayed in order to preserve the Caesars of the pagan Roman Empire so as to stave off the arrival of the papacy, the Antichrist, who was to replace him. Even the first century Christians were Protestants. They protested the Pope before he even existed. Daniel foresaw it. John foresaw it. Paul foresaw it. And he said in the early 13th century was founded the Inquisition. Have you ever heard the term Inquisition? Do you know what it is? Did your church ever teach you what the Inquisition was? You know what? Some Sunday morning you need to walk up to your pastor right in front of the whole congregation. They say, Mr. Pastor, will you please tell us about the Inquisition and watch his face turn red and let everybody else watch his face turn red and listen to his answer. Well, we don't want to talk about that anymore. We're all about unity now. We're not going to live in the past. We're going to live in the future. We want peace and unity. We don't want to return to those old wars. We don't want to fight against Antichrist. We want to join Antichrist. That's going to be his answer. Trust me, you go to church Sunday and you ask your pastor to teach for the next three Sundays in a row everything he knows about the Inquisition. You know how long it'll take? Five minutes, because that's all he can remember of it. That's all he's ever been taught about it in seminaries, that it existed. The Spanish Inquisition, what was there, like maybe 50,000? It's all history. They're never going to tell you that there were millions, hundreds of millions of God's people that have been killed from pagan Rome all the way to today, and the killing is more profuse today in the world wars and the undeclared wars of the world, most of them waged by the United States of America. There's more blood being shed today than there ever was during the Inquisition's. That's the hideous reality. But nobody's going to tell you. You've got to rely on truthful people, people, godly people like Henry Grattan Guinness. He says in Bezier's, every soul was massacred. 7,000 dead bodies were counted in a single church where the people had taken refuge. The whole country was laid waste. An entire people, let me read it again. An entire people was slaughtered, and the eloquent witness of these early reformers was reduced to silence of the sepulcher. They made sure there were no witnesses left to tell about it. They all assumed room temperature by the most hideous and grossest means possible. He says, thus began the tremendous war against the saints foretold in Daniel and the Apocalypse. And from that time on, it was murderously prosecuted from century to century. Early in the 13th century was founded the Inquisition and full persecuting powers entrusted by the popes to the Dominican monks. A remnant of the Vaudois escaped from the south of France, took refuge in the Alps, where the light of the gospel had been preserved from the earliest times. You know what the earliest times were? Apostolic times. You remember that church that Paul founded in Rome? Well, it was persecuted out of Rome. Guess where it ended up? In the Alps. It's the Waldenses 
the apostolic church, not far from Rome, the Vatican, the Antichrist, and they held out in the valleys of the mountains in the refuge of the Alps for 600 years proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and denouncing Antichrist and fighting Antichrist who led crusade after crusade, 600 years of crusades against the Waldenses against the first century church. And your pastor never told you one cussed word about it, did he? Not one word. And I'll guarantee you, he won't tell you anything about it today, not even if you ask, not even if you threaten him with his job. He won't answer your questions because he's an ecumenical evangelical belly He is a papist in waiting, may well be Jesuit trained, ready to make you Roman Catholic and take the Eucharist and believe in transubstantiation and worship of the Virgin Mary and confessing your sins to a priest and everything else. Even my sister reported to me that the charismatic church to which she goes, the pastor arrives every morning in a paper mache bishop's mitre apostasy, and no one's got the courage to denounce it for what it is. Well, I do, and you better too. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross, this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt, so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross. Without our Savior, we're total lost.